I'm delighted to be joined in, in this series of podcasts again by a, a favorite of mine, a hero of mine. I, I, I shouldn't be saying that so so openly, but Neville Southall, Everton legend, a, a player as a as a goal and a goalkeeper who I certainly looked up to for so much of, of, of my career. This is 25 for 25, a show racism, the red card podcast. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Um, Neville, it's, it's a delight to have you join me. Thanks. Thanks for spending the afternoon with me. Thank you very much for inviting me, Shaq. I've always, always followed your career with interest. And oh. especially, well, especially once you're finished. You're too kind, Neville. You're too kind. And let, let me let me say this straight off the top. I mean, as a young man growing up in Trinidad Tobago, half a world away from from Goodison, um, you you really were a, a hero of mine. And I, I looked I looked at and up to you um, in, in around this position. You know, I, I, the goalkeeper, I, I, a position that's so kind of underrated, undervalued, particularly back then. But but you stood out, and and, and while while we recognise the power of sport in today's world, back then, did, did you is that something that dawned on you that you could be having this kind of an impact on a young man that you would, that possibly never would have would have meet, would meet otherwise half a world away? I don't think so. I think you, Shaq, you know what it's like. You're in a bubble, in a football club. All it matters is a game, the next training session. I think as you get older, you tend to realise it, and as as football changed slightly, and I, and as you know, once Sky came in, it became a lot easier. I think, and people become more famous when they get on television a lot more. So yeah, you know, I used to get letters from all over the world, you know, and some of them were like mad letters, and some of them were really good letters, and mm. some were funny letters, and yeah. So I used to get them all over the world, and yeah, you you, you sort of. <laughs> You just want to send something back because they made the effort to send it to you. So, yeah. you know, I was sure that I wrote back to people and if I could send them some, I would send them some. Because I think part of your job as a footballer, you're an ambassador for the club. So you, you have mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, you make sure you, you value the people that are around. And like I say, words are so powerful, but I don't think you know it at the time, Jack. I think, you yeah. know, when you at the time, you know, I've spoke to lads, I've spoke to... When I was in a, when they were in apprentice at Torquay, and he said, mm. well, "You said this to me," and I didn't went and did this, and I went, "All oh, right, okay." And I yeah, thought, "Yeah, Jesus, that's that, that's that's something you got to think about because I never really yeah. thought if somebody asks you something, you know, we we I'll tell you the story. We had a really grumpy apprentice at Torquay right when I was finishing my mm. career. Oh God, he was grumpy every morning." <laughs> He come in and he moaned about it. I said, why, why are you doing it? If you're so unhappy, why are you doing it? Why don't you just, mm. you know, it's not for you. It's not for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. It's not for everybody, is it? Yeah. It looks like making you unhappy. So so why do you keep doing it? it you know, if you mm. don't want to do it, just just say you don't want to do it and then move on. And to be yeah. fair, he took my advice and he went and became <laughs> a pe- He said it was the best thing he ever did. Yeah. yeah. And then afterwards, I thought, Shit, Imagine if he just wanted to stay in the game and I'd said the wrong thing. So, but I think sometimes people know instinctively what to say to people, you know, especially in our sport. Yeah. Where we've seen so many people fall by the wayside, not 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 because they're not talented sometimes, but because there's, there's other factors in them where yeah. they're not enjoying it or that environmentally, may, maybe somebody at the club doesn't like them, yet, yet there's some other. You know, I've known goalkeepers been released from clubs, and I thought, boy, you know, I can't believe he's been released. You know, young mm-hmm. kids. And you're thinking, well, you've got to be. You, we've all got to be lucky to get where we get to. Yeah, to yeah. Talent, but you've still got to be really lucky. Uh, uh, absolutely. It's, I mean, a lot of times society kind of dictates um, the path that or, or that we believe we're supposed to take. You know, mm-hmm. if you're a talented footballer, society says. Well, you know, you train with a club and, and if you get into an academy, that's the path, that's the path you follow. But as, as you say, 
that may not be just because you're, you're talented, just because you have some natural talent. That may not be your calling. That may not be what makes you happy. Um, so I think you, you're right to, to, to point that out to, to the, the, the young apprentice, that if, if it wasn't for him, I think he, he has to take it on himself to, 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 to recognize that and to say to society that that's just not, not who I am. And, and I think there are, are very powerful lessons in there, which leads me right into um, your work post-career, not, not to skip over your, your playing career now, because we'll be here all afternoon talking about you as a player and I've already established I'm, 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 I'm a fan, like, like, like no other. Um, but you, you got into to social work post-career. Um, mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Talk to me about what you do and how you got into to, 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 to doing the, the, this type of work. Well, basically, you know, when you're a senior goalkeeper, Shaq, you mm. sort of try and look after the apprentices and you, you know, you take them under your wing and then anybody that comes, you, you try and look after them because that's your position and you want to see them do well. And I think, you know, I've always done that because other people did it to me when I, when I was, I'd come into the club. So you take that, you take that responsibility on your shoulders. And then once I left football, really, I was looking for something to do. And then somebody came along mm. and said, how about taking... You know, these these lads from basically from, I suppose it was called the Dole and from unemployment benefits and said, look, can you do a series of coaching things with these kids and then try and get them right. to work? And that's how it started, really. I mean, I got, I only had seven of them. Um, mm. We got jobs, but I did the coaching. I took them into schools. You know, so we did the whole PE days. And, and you know, once you invest in somebody, then you've got to see it through. And yeah. You, no, I, I still speak to some of them now. You know, and that yeah, was sure. how many years ago now that we did that. So, and then I went from, because I thought, well, it's no good just doing, I suppose, school kids. I wanted something else. So I found another school who had sort of special needs kids and we worked with them. And then, then the special needs school then asked me to go and work for them. So I went to do that. And then I worked for... And then another place come and asked me to do stuff for them. And then I did my sort of tutor training. And it's just gone from there, really. And I like I like kids who are challenging. Because mm-hmm. me, when we walked in the training ground every day or on the pitch, we didn't know what was going to happen, did we? Yeah. You know, yeah. You can't predict sport, can you? So, yeah. So I, yeah. I'd like, I like the non-conformity of the kids because you don't know what's coming through the door. So it's always a challenge. Yeah. And you have yeah. to think, yeah. and you have to build relationships with the kids. And I think, that's right. you know, you, for me, that was that was the best bit about it. You know, it didn't matter what I did because nobody judged me in that them places on what I used to be. They just judged me how I was on the day. And, yeah. you know, sometimes they weren't very polite and sometimes they were great. <laughs> and sometimes we ended up fighting and, you know, yeah. really... Play football for God knows how many times, right? And I've already been punched once, and I was looking after kids. So. <laughs> I, I think there, there are so many valuable lessons that, that we learn in sport, and maybe as, as professionals take for granted that you can use in, in mentoring use. You know, the, the value of, of, of teamwork, of a, of, a, of a team ethic, of knowing that if I'm not having a good day, I can rely on so many people around me. If yeah. when one of those other people themselves aren't having good days and, and I'm having a good one, I have a responsibility to, to, to kind of carry that, that, that load. I, I think that that, that is, is so valuable. Um, as you say, whether you make football a, a lifelong endeavor or, or not, just in terms, of, in terms of who we are day to day. Yeah, but I, I used to work on, right? We, we both played with players, right? Some who really responded to a bollocking mm-hmm. and some yeah. hope the game. Yeah. Well, so it's all about knowing people's strengths and weaknesses yes. and how to communicate. You, you've got to give them all the same message, but you have to do it in different ways because you can't yeah. talk to in the same way because we're all different. So it's, a, yeah. it's about a strength. And I think goalkeeping is, for me, Shark, it's 90% mental and 10% physical. Yes. Yes. Because you have to know your strengths, your weaknesses, everybody, you have to know how to talk to them, mm-hmm. you have to get to respond, 
you know, after, you know, you got to know how to pick them up, and you got to know mm-hmm. how to tell them politely when they're not doing so well, and maybe not so politely sometimes because they respond to that. You know, and one of the one of the things I, I worry about now, when I hear that about football now, is that they don't raise voices in the dressing room, right? Mm. Which I understand in, in a while, but if you're a player, who when you come on in and you get a bollocking, you you it makes you try. But that's what gets you going. All of them type of players, they're not getting anything at the moment. Yeah. Because it's like they all just come in and talk. And some players mm-hmm. do need to G up. And they yeah. do need to go up. But we're not, it doesn't seem to be, well, it doesn't seem to be a thing anymore. So some of them people are not getting what they do, what they like. So yeah. for all the technology that you see in football now, everybody's got an iPad or a phone or mm-hmm. got, they've got drones and whatever they've got. And yeah, when it comes down to sport, it's about your relationship with your your, your the next yeah. person too, and, and that's right. How you manage it. So, you know, what is life? What is life? Mm-hmm. Life about communication. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. I I didn't know I didn't know about your, your transition in, in, in working with with um, young men who who are looking for employment, and so I, I do know that you're working with the LGBTQ community um, mm-hmm. and and youth. I, I didn't recognize, I didn't know that 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 part that you took. But tell me about some of that work that, that you're involved in now, well, and, now and how I'm... you use and how you use some of, exactly what we were just talking about those interpersonal relationships um, in 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 dealing with some of the issues that that, that community continues to face. Well, I look. I, I think the several. Well, I'll tell you what I do now. I work for Unison, which is mm-hmm. obviously a trade union, and my job is to now at this moment for the next year, to go into care homes, um, private care homes, and find out what the situation is. Because there's a crisis in our care homes in Britain where mm. we can't we can't get people to, to come and we can't recruit, and, and it's very hard to retain people, basically because the money's crap. But so yeah. They all, yeah. And, and, and the, the pond, what they're fishing in, is getting smaller and smaller. So we mm. can find a way of making caring for, for people sexy, and then up the wages, but it's mm-hmm. really, really hard to do that. The other yeah. side, obviously, I do my Twitter stuff, and I'm, mm-hmm. uh, I'm I'm a patron of the Rainbow Toffees, which is Evans LGBTQ plus uh, group. Mm-hmm. I get more stick off middle aged women when I talk about trans people than anybody else I've ever had stick from. It's it's really? weird. Uh, it's a weird mm-hmm. situation. But you see, I think sport. Is on the verge of a massive change. Right? Mm. And this is why I believe because there will be the first gay player to come out, right, in the Premier League. There's mm-hmm. got to, because I think now there's either going to be a, a paper will out him or he'll come out himself. Mm-hmm. And I think we've, we, we don't still create this right atmosphere for him. So yeah. there's, you know, do you know what the FA's approach to a gay player would be if he came out? You know, in the Premier League, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. No, no, nobody knows. You know, and, and mm. I think, if I'm honest, when I first started playing football, I seen a fellow called Lady Coker and Clyde Best. Right. Mm-hmm. Best. First couple of black people I seen ever, right? Mm-hmm. And they were massive, massive stepping stones for mm-hmm. all the other players that came after. And, and yes, you, you look at what who how many lads are playing now. All of them people have been stepping stones to get to a point where now there's nothing. Well, it's, it's not acceptable, but there's nothing basically to stop a black lad getting on now. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the first gay player will be the biggest stepping stone that the gay community or the LGBT people will have. So, mm-hmm. as once that comes, well, once he comes out, and then it, once it becomes normal, then mm-hmm. you're gonna have, you're gonna have a trans player come out. Yeah. So. And the club's going to have to deal with maybe 16-year-olds, trans players. Now, yeah. they've decided where they're going. And at the moment, sport are banning trans people, which mm-hmm. seems terrible. But on the flip side of it, once you ban them and it becomes legal, then you can fight it legally. Whereas before, yeah. they didn't want them. Now, legally, they're banning people. So they have to come up with the evidence, which is, the, I suppose, the... The, all the evidence on this side for the for that for the sport, and then the, all the side on the mm-hmm. evidence 
or the trans people, and, and somewhere in the middle, they're going to have to come to a, a conclusion about what you do with with these people because yeah. everyone's entitled to play sport. Yeah, but it's such a minefield that they has to start the ball rolling, and, and I'm quite happy now that if they make a legal challenge, yeah, it might take ten years, right? But it will eventually get sorted. But if you never talk about it, they never do anything. It's going to go on yeah. and on and on. While it's horrendous for the, the trans people at the moment that can't play sport, maybe their sacrifice will be that one day they will all be able to play sport in, yeah. in the without being banned. So I think sport's got a lot of changes to come, you know, and, yeah. and I think society has because we have yeah. to recognize society. I think it will honestly come down shack right to what is a man and what is a woman. Yeah. As fundamental yeah. and as is that, and then go, right, okay. Where do we go, and then yeah. how do we how do we do this? But I don't know what it's like in in Trinidad. I don't like what, what it's like in America. But in Britain, nobody wants to talk about it, yeah. not because it's not a vote winner. So they, yeah. they try to weep it away. And well, you know, I think maybe in our lifetime we'll see a change. But I think on top of that, what you'll also see is the Super League because that's a mm-hmm. hundred. Um, so changes in sport are going. I think over the next. 10, 15 years are going to be massive. Probably the biggest shake of a sport that we've seen for centuries. Yeah. I yeah. thought, which is uh, quite I, a I think, mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot, um, a, a lot to, to, to be addressed uh, as, as a release of the LGBTQ community and the trans community, particularly as it pertains to sport. And you're absolutely right. For, for too long, those are not discussions that we've had. They continue no. to be discussions that, that we've avoided. Um, and as, especially now, I, I'm not sure. But you, you mentioned how things uh, are, are here in, in, in the US. I think there was a lot of progress made. And then just kind of given the politics of the last five or six years, there has been some regression. Is that something you've, you've also seen um, yes. in, in your work out, out in England? With, with so some of the conversations that... Um, that we've been forced to have, some of the uglier conversations we've been forced to have, um, whether it's around Brexit and, and the fallout around, but how, how has that impacted your work and the conversations that you, you, have, you have been having to have? Well, I, I think Donald Trump and the, the, the Tories in this country have worked on divide and conquer. Mm. So in this country, yes, Brexit was all about how many foreign people were coming into the country to steal everybody's jobs, how many people were trying to flee their own home and, and then come over here illegally. Well, well, really, you know, what they should have been doing is saying, well, how can we help these people? Yeah. How, how, in their own country, how can we help them when they get to France? But well, what they've done is they divided it to win elections. So they've yeah. said, well, they're the enemy, so we can't have them here. So, and because... The, the press are owned by the the right in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody reads their view really apart from probably two papers. So that they've divided the country, and, and now we're at a point where you know Brexit was was not not going to be very good for us because nobody knew what we we're getting into. You know, yeah, and yeah. They made immigration a massive thing, and they, they made and went about it by saying, "Well, they're the enemy. They're not the enemy. They're fleeing for mm-hmm. their lives." So yeah. in a good society, you look after the most vulnerable. And if we're judging how we look after our most vulnerable, we must be like really low down in the list of yeah. humanitarian countries because we don't look after our, our most vulnerable. Mm-hmm. We grind them into the ground so we don't have to deal with them and we just keep stealing for them. And I, and I, think, it's, you know, I think it's wrong. And I think that that's the way the country goes. And then obviously the far right of a very... Christian based, I think, and don't like homosexuality or any shape, mm-hmm. or like anything different. So, therefore, they're, they're going to attack them. And there's a lot of the press over here who attack, you know, trans people because, you know, they don't agree with it. And mm-hmm. because basically, their masters don't agree with it, whoever's running them press. So, yeah, you know, it's, been, it's been hard. And then obviously, we've got Black Lives Matters. And the question I was going to ask you, Shaq, funny, because I've been watching it and watching it, right? Is, is people keep taking a knee, okay? So mm-hmm. is it because they want to keep up that pressure on somebody? Will it, and if they need to do that, 
what is not happening is that they feel that they need to have to keep taking a knee. Is, is, is the, the rest of the FA not listening? Is the FIFA not listening? Because I think at some stage, something's got to be done. Yeah. Because you can't keep on taking a knee because the effect will go. And yeah. my, my thing is, I sat there thinking, well, why are they still doing it? Because is there something that hasn't been done that needs to be done? And if it if it's still going on this long, there's somewhat fundamentally wrong with the FA and the Premier League because they're not doing it. And I I can never find an answer to that. Yeah, I, I think taking the knee is, is a conversation starter. And I mm. think in in finding solutions to, to these issues, mm. you have to first of all admit that there's a problem. And yeah. second, you, you have to start having those discussions. And and for too long, we we've kind of avoided um mm. Or, or the authorities have avoided both of those, those two steps. They, they've been slow to admit that, that there continues to be an issue. I, it, it, because of, of and, and you spoke about it, the number of black players in the game today, they felt that that kind of negated sport, or in this, in this case, football, um, from having those conversations or from, from being a part of, of, of the solutions around, around societal issues. Where, as, as you, you have, have framed so well, sport can be central to how we address so many of our, of our societal issues. Um, so while we as footballers, um, we as footballers enjoy a, a, certain, um, a, a, a certain distance from, from many of the issues in that, in that we're well paid, you can afford you know, certain things in life, even on the field, they, they, you're separated, from, you're separated from, from, from the crowd or any, or any trouble they're in, there's still a lot of black fans who feel intimidated in coming to grounds. There's still a lot of black players at grassroots level that, um, that, that are intimidated and, and racially abused. Um, and those are conversations that we, we, we have to have. We have to get football authorities to, to recognize those, those issues. So whereas, where, while they may not, be, may not be an issue at the Premier League level, at, at the most basic, they, they still very much are. And we have, to recognize, we have to recognize our responsibility to all of the game. We can't just be focused on the Premier League. We have yeah. to recognize our responsibility to all of the game and to all of society. And I, I think, uh, so to, to, to your question, taking the knee forces us to have conversation. And mm -hmm. I think that is the first step in, in, in what's a marathon, but it's the first step. And I also think the transparency around the World Cup would help mm -hmm. because how the hell does Russia get the World Cup and Qatar get the World Cup? Yeah. And, and how, how does some of the Eastern European countries get away with blatant racism mm -hmm. and their fines are just embarrassingly low. So for me, I would I would suggest that if you're racially abused when you play for your country abroad, whoever that country is, yes. then they should, they should be thrown out the competition. And then until, until they get their grassroots right and they stand up their racism right. Uh, until Correct. they do, they should just bin them out the competition. I, I think it, it comes down to about money and in this, mm -hmm. country, it comes down to how this government actually got in government by yeah. making that an issue by saying this is the issue because they're coming to take our job. So the people who, who read certain papers are that stupid that they carry mm -hmm. that streets. And yeah, it, it's got to be there's got to be something else apart from take the knee that forces people to sit up and take notice and absolutely away you know you can take the knee for so long and then people it loses its exactly exactly correct what is the next step would be i i think probably saying i'll tell you what we ain't going to do no more interviews we're going to do nothing until you get off your ass and you solve the problem for, because you've known there's a problem for god knows how long you know and it makes you admire people like clive best and Aidy coke and Cyril. Mm -hmm. And all of them people, because I read Sir Regis's book and it's, it's mad. And I'm thinking, yeah. 
anybody that's got any decency or any humanity about them would read that book and be absolutely sick yes. because that's not the way. And I, I know, look, I, I know we can go back to the thing that, you know, we probably all said things we shouldn't have said and there's different times, but yeah, but we're, li- we're living in a world now where there seems to be less compassion than ever. And it's right. too easy to give negative comments on, Correct. on media. And I think that's that's shown itself in, mm-hmm. in, the, in the streets. You know, yeah. in, when I look at the knife crime in London or whatever, why are they carrying what why are they carrying knives? It's it's not they're carrying knives so we should lock them up. What is the issue that makes them feel that scared right. of carrying a knife? Yeah. And, but yeah. That's that issue. We go, oh, they carry knives out for trouble. Well, well actually, yeah. ninety percent of that is protection. So what are yeah. they so afraid of? Mm-hmm. If they need to do that, and uh, we don't get to that problem. We just get to yeah. the look at these troublemakers. We'll stop them searching. They got knives. Been him, in, been him in prison. And that's not the answer. Yeah. Just to change Absolutely. society. Yeah. If we don't change I- society. We're going to be having this conversation in 10 years, mate. Yeah. I'm, I'm encouraged, though, Nev, that we are having those conversations more and more now. And more and more people are starting to recognize um, the things that you see, their responsibility to shaping, to shaping that, that, that better world. And, and um, oh. you, you, you live that example. So th- thank you very much. If show racism in a red card, right, deals with racism and is recognised by the Premier League, is recognised by the government, why aren't you funded to go into every school in in Mm Britain? That, to me, says they don't believe in it, or they they believe in it to a certain point. And I'm thinking, sitting here, and look, I've worked with you, I've seen you with Wales, and I'm thinking, what are they playing at? Because I think, Uh, do it, and just give you the money to go into the schools because that is the best way of getting to kids because you're yes. using that sport to get into them kids. And I, on all the sessions that I've ever been with, we show racing the red card, right? The kids have listened because it's football and because... Absolutely. They, mm-hmm. Now, if you're going to be serious about changing society, you have to use the best vehicle. Yeah. You know, what is the point of sending 20 white lads into a place and going, oh, I was talking about racing. That ain't going to yeah. work. No racism yeah. red card should be in every school and it should be on the on the curriculum. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be a massive boost to it to everybody. Mm-hmm. And I, it makes me really angry that you're not actually fully funded properly so you can go into every school. And I, I think that's disgraceful myself because I think that to me is the fundamental problem, right? By mm-hmm. like governments and, and the Premier League. And, and mm-hmm. every day, because if you're not funded properly, they're just taking a pick and they're yeah. taking a pick and that to me is is the worst thing I ever I've ever seen. I know it's a bit of a rant, Shaq, but that's you know, all right. No, I, I appreciate the rant. I, I and ultimately that's that's what we're hoping for, and we'll we'll continue to work towards that. And in the meantime, we'll continue to do as as we always have. You brought up a couple of things, and I'm, I'm mindful of your time, Nev. You brought right. up the World Cup. You brought yeah. up Welsh football. Yeah. Wales, of course, going back to the World Cup in, in 2022. I mean, since since, since 1958, last time you were in the World Cup? Yeah, how, how does that make you... And I, I mean, you were part of some of the great Welsh teams and, and just hadn't been able to, to get over that line. But uh, as a fan, how how you feel seeing, seeing Wales go back? I think we've got something that... Well, you lot over in America have nicked, haven't you? You've got a guy... <laughs> So you, you've nicked <laughs> Gallagher and you're, you're sort of giving him plenty of sunshine, plenty of golf, so he's nice and fit. So, uh, and so he's happy. <laughs> you know, Shaq, right? He can have three minutes and win as a World Cup. If you add up all these things, how, how long does it take to do a, take a free kick? How long does it take yeah. to goal for him? I don't think England have got the same. Right. In, mm. right? I, 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 but you can watch this fella and you go, Oh my god! Yeah, he's a nightmare. And yeah. he pops up goals, or he scored a free kick. Yeah. He's been the greatest Welsh player we've had because he delivers on a big stage. Yeah. You yeah. know, to me, 
Uh, he's like our Frank Sinatra. He goes out and he does it all the time. He, you know, like, but he likes Vegas. He, he's not so. <laughs> so for me, he's, the bigger the competition, he's going to walk in there again. If you watch your westerns on your television over there, he's like the the gunslinger coming in mm. to have the last fight of his of his career, and he's yeah. either going to play with all the loot, or he's going to be in Boot Hill. There's no two ways yeah. about that. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. I think that that's his motivation. It's his, you know, it's sort of like when you read, if, if you're reading a book now or you're writing a book, you say, right, last chance for the hero. Mm. Last chance for the hero. Can he produce in, in the biggest tournament in the world and get them somewhere where they've never, ever been before? And I, and I think that's a fascinating thing for him because if it does, someone's going to make a film of his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be a hero. I mean, Wherever he goes, we people know him now. Imagine if he does that. And I and I hope he does it because I would love to see what the Spanish headlines at the press would be yeah. in Spain. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, know, I know I know one thing. If, if they do make a movie of his life, it'll be it'll be mandatory viewing for, for every school in Wales, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but again, what people people hang on his every word. Yeah. So what he says can make, make a massive difference to other people. And he's done some good work, to be fair to him. You know, and he's, he, he seems, to, when I've met him, he seems a really level-headed lad and, and not bothered about anything. And he's, he's always here for the Welsh team. And, and I think people really appreciate, not the fact that he's a great player sometimes, I think they, they appreciate the fact that whatever the game is, mm. whether it's old over away or Kazakhstan away or anybody that's, you know... In the past, people haven't turned up for it. He turns up for all the games he wants to play. So I think people yeah. really appreciate his commitment to it. Never mind what he does, the commitment yeah. first. They, they love him. And, and at, at the same time, too, as, as, as incredible a player as Gareth Bale is, as much of a star as, as he is for, for the Welsh team, the, everything about Welsh football has seemed to come together so, so wonderfully well. And I'm, I'm a little bit biased here in that the Welsh FA have been incredible supporters of mm-hmm. our work at, at Shuris and the Red Card. They really have. And so much, so it's, it's good as, as a neutral. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I, I, I have no horse in this race, so I have no team in the World Cup. But to see how Wales football has kind of made it their calling to represent everybody in Wales, regardless of how you identify, to, to, to see them embrace what what I, I think this sport can be in terms of in, in terms of addressing these societal issues, maybe it's not that big a surprise to see to see Wales Wales succeed. Thank you very much um, for your time for for sharing your experiences, what this game meant to you, how you continue to use the, the game to to push for a more equitable society. You were an example, um, and, and you were an example to me. 30 years ago, and you continue to be an example to me today. I, I, I cannot thank you enough for that alone. Shaq, you're a great goalie, mate, but you're an even better man. And that's why I admire what you do and, uh, and with all your colleagues. I think you're a brilliant guy, mate, and I would do anything, any time for you. Thank you very much. And you know the same goes for me and you, Nev. Thank you so much once again. 